Welcome to the We Are Libertarians Daily Show. I am your guest host, Hody Johns, and I am here today. We got a real treat for you. I'm here with Mike Shipley. How are you doing today? Fabulous. How are you? <laughs> I would expect nothing less from you. I am now equally fabulous. Yay. Thanks I, uh, for having me on today. Yeah, you know, it was really great to get you on here. So I'm going to give you a, a, a brief introduction, or at least my ver version of the introduction here. If you know of Mike Shipley, odds are you have uh, you either love him or you hate him. Uh, and I just love him. But there's something I did want to go over. This is going to be like you've never heard Mike before. What we're going to do today is... Give Mike a chance to play offense. I feel like most people see Mike play defense, and Mike loves playing defense, and I can see why. He's good at it. Uh, I'm a big sports guy, so if I can give a sports analogy, I will. Uh, he's the Dikembe Mutombo of defending the libertarian ideals. And if you bring that weak stuff inside, he's going to swat that ball into the stands and let you know and wag that finger in your face. The thing is, is defense is ugly. It's brutal. It's offensive. They play mind games. They get in your head. And Mike is up in everybody's head. But what I'm going to do is flip the court for him. And I'm going to give him a chance to play some offense. So we're going to we're going to see the pretty side of Mike Shipley today that everybody's looking forward to. Um, so just question one. Uh, I want you to sell me on the idea of a horizontal business. If I'm an average person, what is it? What is it like to have one? Um, yeah, we'll just start there. Well, here, hold on. Jump up here. Novels is here for her her cameo. She makes one every time I go online. Oh, wait. <laughs> Never mind. She's lying to me. Oh. Come here, baby. Come we'll get her eventually. Oh. Uh, Novels Shipley, if you if you do follow Mike. Oh, there she is. Uh, I was gonna, there's Novels. Oh, Almost more uh, Facebook followers for Novels than Mike himself. So, All right. Uh, <laughs> not that you should be jealous of the dog, but there you go. Sorry. She does that every time a thing starts, so <laughs> you're fine. She wants to know who I'm talking to. All right, so sell you on a horizontal uh workplace. Yeah. Well, first of all, do you believe in property rights? I do, yeah. Right? So you do you believe that um nobody but you has a higher claim on yourself and the fruits of your labor? Uh yeah, I would I would hope so. Okay, then you already believe in horizontal workplaces. You're just very, very accustomed to, well, uh, let me put it like this. You already believe in the human right to arrange your own economic life the way that you want to. Yes. Right? Okay. So you can sell your labor by the hour for, you know, a small fraction of what's worth, but you don't have to. You have other options, right? So the the argument for horizontal workplaces is that because nobody else but the individual has a higher claim over how the fruits of their labor should be um you know utilized or distributed or what should be done with that and because of the connection between the individual and their property right is their labor right yeah so the argument for a horizontal workplace is that i should have a say in how our shared product is sold or distributed and the fruits of selling or distributing it um, are divided among us, right? So yeah. it's just reconnecting the agency over the fruits of my labor back to the worker. So let's say I'm, I'm in a, a factory and we manufacture shoes and I'm, I'm the guy on the line that I make. Let's just say I make the soles of the shoes and somebody else ships in leather and somebody else ships in the rubber and somebody else, you know, but I'm the guy who molds the soles, soles of the shoes. What changes in a horizontal workplace for me, if I'm that person, I'm living by the hour, you know, probably making minimum wage, you know, what, what changes for me? So a few things change. Nothing for one thing, very little might probably change about the way we, organize the production side of the, the workflow, right? Because, well, that's not even true. Certain things in terms of, of hierarchical, like power imbalances, right? So okay. you wouldn't have a boss in the same way that we understand bosses now, right? So for instance, you might be asked more often how you think, you know, your department should operate, right? Okay. You might be asked questions that you currently don't get asked at all. 
Like for instance, um, should we risk going with this new supplier or not? Right. That would be typically something that, you know, would be decided by, you know, a small group of connected people in the company. Sure. If I make so, the rubber part of the soles, then I'm like, Hey, I really like working with this kind of rubber, but I can't communicate to the CAO in, in this current situation. Right. Exactly. I mean, okay. In fact, that's a great example. So you are the one who best knows which rubber is going to work for you. Okay. And I don't know if anybody else can relate to being in a workplace where the boss actually doesn't know very much at all about what you're doing <laughs> and is making really poor decisions and imposing them on you. I wonder if anybody can relate to that. So so I think everybody can relate to that. But let's say I'm scared of the person that I work with now who's very lazy and who's terrible and who doesn't know much about the business and doesn't care about the quality of souls. Should I be worried about that person suddenly having more say in the business? Well, I think that we have to look at something that we already know about the profit motive, Okay, which is that when I am experiencing the more prosperity I'm getting out of what I'm doing, the more interested I'm in, in whether it succeeds or not. Right. Right. So the way it is right now where wages are suppressed to the barest minimum possible, sure. then the worker only has an incentive to bring the barest minimum possible effort. And so it's hardly surprising that we're surrounded by people that aren't really putting very much effort into things. Who can really blame them, actually? So I think that, first of all, we have to credit our fellow human beings with all the same, you know, we already believe that, you know, they have the capacity to choose not to, you know, hurt each other or take their stuff. Right. I think that we can also credit them with the capacity to actually care about the things that they do if they're experiencing the rewards from it. Gotcha. So so it's more of the system that that filters these people into my workplace that says, you know, hey, you're going to be a minimum wage person, might as well be in a place where it's the easiest for your closest to you, as opposed to incentivizing saying we can maximize a lot of your labor. Sure. And so then and you have an incentive to maybe be in a market where you excel, as opposed to in a market where you don't care. Right. And I would go even, I would d dive even deeper with that critique and point out that the public education system is actually set up to produce people who do very little critical thinking. And there's a reason for that, right? So if we not only liberate our workplaces and make them horizontal, but also liberate the schools and make them more empowering, then I think overall society is going to be generating people who are much more equipped to leverage their agency in a healthy and prosperous way. I almost hate to go off on a tangent, but I feel like I have to because it's so important that a lot of our school system was established during the industrial zone where we only wanted minimum wage manufacturing job workers. Isn't that right? Uh, there's yeah well yeah so supposedly you know public schools were this innovation in in early american times and that was like right when industrialism was starting to happen so i mean i i don't i don't know that there were people sitting around in cloaks in a shadowy room going ha, ha, how do we all turn them into wage laborers <laughs> but i think that because those things you know correlation is not causation but there mm -hmm. can still be a symbiotic relationship where some of the people in the room are going hmm I can benefit from this in ways that they're not going to figure out for a few generations, right? So right. they might do that. And if you see the industrial age going on around you and you say, well, I want my kid to be a part of this, then maybe you manufacture a system that's a part of it without realizing you've developed a system to manufacture peons as opposed to people who excel or artisans, right? Um, so, so what do we need to change in our current economy? Give me some like libertarian things we can do. What needs to change in our current economy to have our businesses do this? Is this just something we can ask our business right now to start doing? Or is there a system in place that keeps my boss and CEOs from making a business horizontal? I would say there are – one of the things we can do is unionize our workplaces. And I don't mean to just turn to the nearest state-sanctioned union – but I mean, embrace a radical union like the IWW that specifically rejects the power of state as a means to an end, right? So yeah. these are unions that, well, really, there's only one that I know of, the IWW. Um, this is a union that specifically, like I said, rejects the state and works directly to persuade the people around them why a horizontal workplace would be better, right? Right. That's not really like going to be... a 
that that's one component. So just letting people know why the alternative could be better uh-huh. and awakening them to the hope that they can benefit from that too. And then the other one is that our existing economy, and there's two parts to part two. So I don't know if this is the right to, but anyway, sure. um, Hit them both. One of the things is that we currently live in a market that has been dominated for so long by people centralizing wealth through force and fraud Mm -hmm. that we experience a status quo where a small number of people have the capital to start um, a new business. So you often hear this thing, well, why don't you just start your own business? Well, that would be great if more people actually had savings. Um, in a in a horizontal cooperative, the capital comes directly from the people that are starting it up. But we're going to catch twenty two right now because the capital is guarded by you know force and fraud and held by a small number of people. So, um, beginning to dismantle the market structures and controls that are uh, leading to those wealth imbalances will make it possible so that as the wealth begins to um, redistribute naturally through market forces mm-hmm. and it allows more people to have more disposable income to to use as capital if they choose so for those of you hearing mike right now and and, and are hearing uh some some things that might scare you a little bit please go back a few episodes to our uh episode about wage slavery that i did with sarah brady wagner it's it's really insightful into how the system is set up right now in where you're may be able to choose which crumbs of which plate you can choose, but you can't choose what you're eating. You can't choose the steak dinner, essentially. Uh, I mean, this is an an analogy, but Mike is addressing something that's a little more complex. Thankfully, we have addressed it. So it is, I'm a pro-capitalist person. And so I don't want you to hear these things and think that this is anti-capitalism. Really, I think this is the next stage of capitalism, which is competing currencies, which is freedom from, from that Fed and from those centralized currencies. Um, so so what, what would you tell other people who are scared of the word socialist? What's the biggest difference, I guess, between you and your vision of the future and Stalin, uh, you know, well, Mao, Chavez. Um, yeah, I okay, start there. So basically, there we have to look back to the 19th century when these critiques first started emerging, and of course, they're a response to uh, what we started to see in the industrial age, right? So these weren't present in original classical liber- liberalism. Right. Um, you know, because we were still an agrarian society, right? So, but in the 19th century, we start seeing industrialization and, and people start bringing a critique of the top down, you know, status quo workplace. And so this is where we start hearing this, these horizontal narratives, these anarchist narratives emerge. And one of the people was Karl Marx. So Karl Marx had some ideas around how a workplace should be structured. And so did uh, many other anarchists, right? The thing that was different about Marx is that he was actually a sociologist. So he has this quote, scientific idea that, um, and he, it's almost like he thinks he's a fortune teller and the people that still believe in him think that his predictions are really going to come true. That a worker state is a necessary transition to a communist society, right? So the difference is, People that in in places where Marx is Marx has been seen as the reference point, they are deliberately trying to make that prediction come true. So, in other words, they implement a worker state on purpose, and then, of course, to the to a libertarian or an anarchist ear, like that's an absurd idea. States don't wither away, like. Who does that? You know what I mean? So <laughs> the big difference is rejecting that predict- prediction or that even if that prediction came through, it, it would be a good thing. Like it wouldn't be. It's not. It's proven that it's not. And so that's the biggest difference. So uh, let me flesh, d- dig a little deeper here. So the biggest fear that we should have is if the state imposes this worker state. Oh, right yeah. Is, yeah. Is that's, the, that's the biggest difference is the state says, hey, here's what we're doing now versus people saying, hey, here's a good idea. Let's try this out. Well, yeah. And if there are any Marxists listening, I just want to point this out. If having the ruling class in control of the means of production is capitalism, then having the socialist ruling class in control of the means of production is still capitalism. So <laughs> consider letting that sink in. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think I have time for for a quick quick aside here. So, like, 
the the word socialist, if we talk about that, what I noticed that you and others have decided not to abandon it. Now you call yourself a libertarian socialist, right? We're still libertarian here, but haven't abandoned the word socialist. Now a lot of times the word just becomes so unpopular and so toxic that people say, I can't, I can't do it anymore. One of the good examples for me in my life is conservatism. Um, it's just become such a word that gets used by people who are homophobic or who are, uh, you know, pro drug war or, you know, you know, anti, anti choice, you know, that I have just decided to say, you know what, I can't do it anymore. Conservative used to be a means of change, which is, it's something that I still believe in, in a slow means of change, things that we can do over a time period as opposed to violent revolution all at once to get to a certain destination. So I, I have abandoned the word conservative. What makes you think that the term socialist might be salvageable? Well, so to be quite honest, when the Libertarian Socialist Caucus started, we named ourselves the Black Flag Caucus. Okay. Um, because it was going to be a big tent anarchist caucus. And then it held a vote and named itself that. So to a certain extent, um, you know, the democratic process chose <laughs> for there, me. There are that. people with my worries, though, as well, <laughs> that voted that just lost the vote is what you're saying. Um, yeah, but in retrospect, I kind of, I see some wisdom in the idea that it was an elephant in the room when people really start drilling into the ideas and they realize that their roots are in 19th century socialist, sure. anarchist, um, Even social anarchist. Some, yeah. yeah, they're gonna, sooner or later, we're going to be accused of being commies anyway. Oh. So sometimes, you know, I had someone giving me some good advice one time and she pointed out that like, if there's an elephant in the room, okay, you don't pretend it's not there because sooner or later it's going to poop <laughs> and then people are going to start smelling the poop and they're going to wonder what the heck it is. And th they're going to figure out there's an elephant and then it's going to be like a thousand times more embarrassing than if you just put a bow on the, on the freaking thing. Right. And celebrate its beauty and talk about how exotic it is. Right. Sure. Like claim it and own it and make it yours. And then you have the chance to package it and, you know, if there's any, and there has been a lot of confusion and a lot of animosity. And that's, I think you referenced how often I'm on the defense. Yeah. Um, that has not been pleasant. And I didn't pick that. I didn't vote for the name change, but the name change went through. And in hindsight, I can see some benefit from going ahead and having those difficult conversations. And it is a, an illustrious history to lose. Uh, if you are sitting at home on your computer right now, before you get angry at this new idea of libertarian socialism, look it up on Wikipedia and you will see this is not a new idea of libertarian socialism. This is something that might predate libertarianism itself and something that I mean, there's almost more entries on libertarian socialism than libertarianism. And so it, it would be a – for me, I think that's the worst part to lose is the illustrious history that you have with it before it got co-opted by, you know, the, the Mao and, and Stalin and, and those guys. Um, so you've been a value al valuable ally to libertarians. Is there a type of libertarian that you would say you cannot get along with? Is it more of a philosophical difference or is it like a character difference that you say, I don't stand, like, I can't stand judgmental people versus I can't get along with ANCAPs? What, what, what would you say are like the dividing lines there? So for me, uh, there is a couple to, I don't fall for the mistake of thinking that when someone politically identifies as, you know, an ANCAP or a minarchist or whatever it is that, that, um, that automatically disqualifies them from being an ally. Uh, I think that's a, making the mistake of collectivist thinking, but, uh, so you, we start to hear the principles behind what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And I think definitely like Hoppians who are into the whole helicopter thing that is objectively not libertarianism. And then we have another where... So the, um, let me go back real quick, because I think a lot of our audience might not know that. This is where we're talking about throwing former socialists off of helicopters, right? Mm -hmm. Or police officers out of helicopters and that type of right. thing. Right. Okay. That is, that is one real world manifestation of these ideas. And then there's a broader category where... Well, it's not even, it's the same category. It's the same logic. So okay. the logic that Pinochet implemented 
where he was dropping communists out of helicopters okay. is the sort of covenant community logic that if a community sets a standard of association that it has a right to then um, enact its disassociative rights by violence. Because if you exist while in violation of their covenant, then you are de facto initiating course or force of fraud. And, you know, I mean, the hard part with that logic is it's hard to really argue directly with that core piece of the logic. But um, what I always come back to is that it's proportionality. Like just existing is not like I'm not actually like harming you by being queer in your borders. Right. Like I'm right. not actually sure. connecting harm on you. Right. And, and it, it actually is brings- very libertarian to let those people do that. Right. That, that, that almost seems at the heart of it to let you make your own decisions until you harm somebody else. It does. It does. So I feel like it's not justifiable to imagine that a community can set certain certain agreements of a social contract like that i okay. think would violate libertarian principles in all the same ways that they do if the state enacts them okay. I, I, and so that really this is just the non-aggression principle right you don't hurt you don't enact violence to get your way and so you're saying you don't get along with people that would enact violence to get their way because even though they say I mean, you look at what happened to the poor socialism, where they enacted violence to get their way. You just wouldn't get along with the other guys either who enacted violence to get their way. The capitalists who would say, we have to force these guys to throw them off of helicopters to get our way of capitalism, right. whatever it no, may be. And I would say, even if you were an ANCAP in Pinochet's Chile, you should have been with the resistance. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, you're on the you're on the wrong side of the fight on that one, you know. And, and there's a uh, you know one of my favorite examples when we talk about socialism and when people get kind of creeped out by the by the term is one of our best libertarian allies in, in George Orwell was a socialist, and you can look that up on his page. He absolutely was, and he had a huge problem with the way socialism was being enacted. That little difference. Obviously, it's huge because we think of Orwell as this, you know, some right wing champion, which he is not. He is a socialist. He was just extremely opposed to the involuntary method which, with which people were forcing socialism on them. You know, right. I'm going I'm to turn the last thoughts over to you, uh, but that's my last thought is just these people are our allies. I don't like that people like Mike. Are for even if he is comfortable with it, I don't like that people have to fight to stay in the libertarian party or stay in the libertarian philosophy. Even that they should feel comfortable here. If you're a liberty-minded person, if you, I mean, you heard what Mike just said about saying the really the only people he can't get along with are people that talk about throwing him off of a helicopter to kill him. <laughs> this is a, an ally. <laughs> Mike and I have philosophical difference differences if you see us talk on facebook I, i'm a minarchist and i understand that he's not but we make better allies than enemies by a mile if mike has his philosophy come true our world is a better place if i have my philosophy come true my our world is still a better place whether it be for people like mike or people like me we can split hairs on which one's the best world but ideally we just want to put these ideas against each other and say hey you know what let's maximize freedom you try it your way i'll try it my way and we'll see who wins the day um so mike uh final thoughts for you also include how they can find you on social media or what you're up to these days uh how you how you're interacting with people go ahead all right well i think my final thought i've been if you've seen that hashtag bot immunity going around and you've been a lot of people uh, i I guess I assumed that everyone knew what that meant, but I, a lot of times I still hear back that they just thought it was like a sexual innuendo. I haven't. I'm and, curious now. So <laughs> throw well, it Well, I mean, uh, on one se- in, on one level, it was um, we sort of the sensational, like the shock value of the innuendo helps it like stick in your mind. Okay. Or wherever else you sure. want it. Wink. <laughs> sure. And what, what was that hashtag again? It's bottom unity. Bottom right? unity. Okay. But, but it's not a, really a sexual reference. It's referring to the bottom half of the political compass where all the libertarians are. Right. So it's really a call to action for people across the bottom half of the political compass to unite. And that means right and left libertarians. 
And these are people who for a long time have been considered at odds. So I want to kind of emphasize the value of actually, you know, the bottom line for electoral politics is that it is a numbers game. We need more of us than there are of them, right? So anything that can bring more libertarians together and help them actually exist in the same room together and, and, and coordinate their efforts against the state instead of against each other is a good thing. So um, just embracing that idea. If it's freaking you out right now, try to just give it some space and just consider whether um, you can find that you have more in common with another libertarian than you thought. I, for me, before I met you and Matt, Kino. I believed that socialism and and authoritarianism was the same thing. When I put the, together political compass, I said, you know, use whatever term you want for this. And it wasn't until I contacted you guys that I realized how wrong that I was and how much better off I am to have you guys on my friends list and how good you guys are for libertarianism and how much you pull some of those left-leaning thinkers in to say, yeah, we're not going to mandate, you know, some of the things that the big government leftists would choose but wouldn't it be nice if you could at least choose that for yourself in some type of society so it's a really great pull it's i mean it's evangelism for left-leaning people for democrats and left-leaning republicans to get into this libertarian movement i mean it is and i guess i'll just maybe just to emphasize a piece of the thought imagine if you're a candidate you know and you have a broader palette of libertarian thinking to select from then you you're in a stronger position so if you're in you know a really right-leaning conservative district then you're probably going to draw on the ancap tradition right but if you're in like a a heavily blue district Mm -hmm. uh, you might want to draw on the language of working class liberation because we can compete and win on the level of labor and all of that thinking is libertarian thinking and there are you know there are narratives and arguments and you know ideas out there like the work has already been done we just have to reach into those um those bodies of work and pull out what's helpful for us and i think that is really it's it's a strength it's we'd be crazy not to sure so if somebody has a question for you mike how do they get a hold of you all right so the number one easiest way is to just contact me through my facebook page which is mike shipley comma libertarian so just search uh mike mike shipley libertarian or it's facebook.com slash mikester the number four liberty um, I'm also on Twitter just as Mikester. So those are the two main ways to get a hold of me. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show, for taking the time to do that. I know you're a hot commodity, but you've always had time for my questions, and I really appreciate it. So uh, mm-hmm. thank you for sharing uh, for sharing your way of life. Yeah, thank you, too. Have a fabulous afternoon.